CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. It's no secret that compulsive gamblers are every bit as sick as alcoholics or drug addicts. Gambling is a fever that consumes them as surely as whiskey or heroin. However, even the most habitual and devoted of gamblers might well hesitate when the gamble literally means his life or death. Come on, man. Choose. I'm giving you more of a chance than you gave Lucy. Now, you've got a 50-50 chance. Now, one capsule is harmless, on my word of honor. The other means death. Now, I'm giving you a choice. First chance. You might even have the pleasure of watching me die. Our mystery drama, A Study in Scarlet was adapted from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle classic, especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett, and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. association games provide amusement for many people. They're even employed by psychologists to diagnose aptitudes and attitudes. For example, Scarlett O'Hara brings to mind Rhett Butler, while Romeo immediately suggests Juliet. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. It's possible that many of you wondered how Sherlock and Dr. Watson first met and decided that they would make good roommates. Well, Doctor, you've seen the flat. And I am Sherlock Holmes. I say the flat seems comfortable, and well, as far as you, Mr. Holmes, are concerned, I, I, I imagine we'll have to let time tell us if we're going to get along with each other. Capital thinking, my dear sir. Yes. And let me tell you at once that I shall require the use of this sitting room only when I see my clients. They may come at odd hours, but you'd certainly understand that, being yourself a physician and lately come from Afghanistan. Well, who, who, who told you that, sir? Our mutual friend, Wallaby, told me you were a doctor, but I deduced that you were recently in Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I, I've no wish to be rude, and certainly not on such short acquaintance, but I, I cannot have believed... I was told that you were a doctor, but you carry yourself with an air of a military man, army doctor, just come from the tropics because his face is dark, but his wrist's fair, left arm injured because he holds it slightly stiff in an unnatural position. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have received such a wound? Clearly, in Afghanistan. Well, it sounds simple when you explain it, but I find it rather astonishing. Elementary, my dear fellow. Elementary. As the days wore on, I found Holmes a singularly easy man to live with. Quiet in his way, with regular habits, but with no seeming system for work. Indeed, I didn't discover what work he was engaged in until one morning in March when I arose somewhat earlier than was my custom and at breakfast read an article with the somewhat ambitious title of The Book of Life. <laughs> oh, what utter nonsense. Hmm? Never read such rubbish in my life. What is? Well, this article evidently written by some armchair lounger who solves riddles by sitting safely in his own study. <laughs> I should like to see him clapped down in a third-class railway carriage and asked to name the trades of his fellow travelers. I'd, I'd lay a thousand to one against him. No, ah, you would lose your money. As for that article, I wrote it myself. Uh, you... Yes, yes, I specialize in observation and deduction, which has set me up in my trade. I am a consulting detective. Oh, sir. What, what's that? Well, to put it succinctly... I step in when government and private detectives are at fault. The very next day, when a letter came by special messenger, it was signed Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard, 
would ask my roommate to come, if possible, to three Lauriston Gardens off the Brixton Road. Holmes asked me along, and in a very short time we alighted from a cab at the address. Now, we're fortunate that it rained so heavily last night. But come along. I see Lestrade waiting at the door. Uh, it's nice of you to come right along with the room, but uh, who is... Uh... This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. If you don't object... Oh, sir, any friend of yours is always welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, come this way and I'll show you the room. Ah, by the by, Lestrade, did you come here in a cab? I oh, know, sir, no. Now, as you can see, this house was to let. All the other rooms were locked, and here the only item of furniture is the dining room table. And that, as you can see, is occupied by the corpse. I assume you've already examined the body. Is there no wound? No, no, no wound at all, Mr. Holmes. And yet we have these great gouts and splashes of blood all mm. over. Then the blood must belong to the murderer, if a murder has been committed. If a murder was committed? Well, look at the man's face, the distortion of his limbs. Yes, yes, Horrible. yes, yes, Watson, I've noted all those things. But tell me, Lestrade, did you move the corpse at all? Oh, no more than was necessary for the purposes of examination. Mm-hmm. Well, then you can have the body taken to the mortuary. There's nothing more to be learned from it. Right. All right, you two, you can take the body out. I say, look at that. There's been a woman there. That's a woman's wedding ring which just fell from the body. As if this wasn't already complicated enough. What did you find in the pockets? Oh, a gold watch, gold pin with a strange device. Looks like some kind of a cube. A Russian leather card case. Card printed reading Enoch. J. Drebber of Cleveland, uh, two letters to one E. J. Drebber and one to Joseph Stangerson. Mm-hmm. Address? American Exchange, Strand. They refer to steamship sailings. As it's clear that this unfortunate man was about to return to New York. And this other man, Stangerson, have you made any inquiries about him? Well, of course, Mr. Holmes, but you haven't seen yet what I consider is crucial. Now, it's over here in the corner, mm. against the wall. Mm. And you can't see it unless you strike a match. <clears throat> in the particular corner illuminated by the flaring match, part of the wallpaper had been peeled away, and there, scrawled in blood-red letters, was a single word, R-A-C-H-E, Rush. Ah, Mr. Holmes, what do you think of that? Fascinating discovery. I've not had time to examine this room yet, but with your permission, I'll do so now. Would it disturb you if I were to reconstruct how the word came to be there and what it means? Oh, by no means. I'd be interested to hear your theory, Lestrade. Well, first, why was this corner chosen to write upon? Because, Mr. Holmes, if you'd observe that candle on the mantelpiece... Mm, I see it. Well, that must have been lit at the time, and that made this corner the brightest spot in the room. Excellent, Lestrade. I congratulate you. And the murderer wrote with his or her own blood. Now, you see this smear where it has trickled down the wall? My dear Lestrade, you're outdoing yourself. I agree. Well, that disposes of the idea of suicide, right? Absolutely. It was murder. But now that you've found the writing and done so brilliantly... What do you construe it to mean? Well, simply that the dead man was going to write the female name, Rachel, but was uh, interrupted before he or she had time to finish. Oh, you mark my words, Mr. Holmes. When this case comes to be cleared up, we'll find out that a woman named Rachel had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Interesting and partly accurate. First, you're correct. It was murder. Secondly... The murderer was a man. Uh, He's more than six feet tall, in the prime of life, and he has small feet for a man of his height. He wore coarse, square-toed boots and smoked a Trichinopoly scar. One moment, sir. I I can't get it all down. It's too fast. (laughs) Oh, yes, yes, yes. He came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on his off foreleg. In all probability, the murderer has a florid complexion, and the fingernails of his right hand were remarkably long. Now, these few indications may be of some assistance to you. Oh, yes, of course. I, I, uh, I, I must uh, thank you, but uh, 
But, Mr. Holmes, if the man was murdered, how was it done? Poison. Poison? Hmm? But, but, uh, but how, I mean, did he... Did uh, one he... other thing, Lestrade. Rush is the German word for revenge. So don't waste any time looking for a woman named Rochelle. <laughs> You're not at all as sure of those particulars you gave Lestrade as you seem to be. Well, there is no room for error. If you take the trouble to observe, you'd reach the same conclusions. On arriving, I saw the cab had made two ruts with its wheels close to the curb. Yes. You know about last night's rain? There were also marks of the horse's hooves. Plain for all to see. Oh, yes, yes. Lestrade said that he had not come by cab, so it, it must have brought those two individuals to the house. Well, that, that seems simple enough, but... The description of the man, his height. And My the... dear doctor, when a man writes on a wall, he doesn't lean down or reach up. He writes at eye level. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now that writing was over six feet from the ground. Child's play, doctor. <laughs> I, I must confess you make it seem that way, but his age is... Well, if a man can stride four and a half feet without the smallest effort, he can't be approaching senility. That was the breadth of a puddle in the garden walk that Square Toes had hopped over. The patent leather black boots had gone wrong. Ah, but Holmes, that would mean that these two... Uh... Came in the same cab. Right. Were as friendly as possible until they got inside the house. Well, I still can't understand about the fingernails from the cigar. The writing on the wall was done by a man's fingernail, dipped in blood. Oh, yes, sir. The wall plaster was slightly scratched, which wouldn't have been the case if the man's nails had been trimmed. And as for the cigar, I have made a special study of cigar ashes, written a monograph on the subject. And the ash that I picked up from the floor could only have come from a Trichinopoly cigar. I was pleased to see that I wasn't the only man who was astounded by the deductive reasoning processes of my friend Holmes. We'd gone to see Constable Reds, who'd found the body. What I particularly want to know is, was the street empty when you went out to call for help? Well, it was, as far as anybody that could be of any good goes. What do you mean? <laughs> I've seen many a drunk chap in my time, but never anyone so bleeding drunk as that cove. How was he dressed? Uh, brown overcoat. Had he a whip in his hand? No. Mm, you must have left it behind. Uh, you didn't happen to see or hear a cab after that? Uh, I was tending to my business. You should rather say that you were letting the man who holds the clue to this mystery slip through your fingers. Come along, Doctor. Well, uh, Holmes, I'm afraid I'm as much in the dark as the constable. If this man is the second party in the mystery, why should he return so soon to the scene of the crime? The ring, Doctor. The wedding ring. Oh. If we have no other way of catching him... We can always bait our line with the ring. Some two centuries before Hamlet had cried, the play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Now Sherlock Holmes has informed Dr. Watson that the ring will catch the man who scrawled the German word Rosh in blood across the wall of the murder room. Act two will tell us whether he's right. We all use our friends in one way or another. Sometimes some of us use friendship in a way that stretches the ties almost to the breaking point. But I'll venture to say that no one ever used a friend as often and as recklessly as Sherlock Holmes used Dr. Watson and still retained his friendship and loyalty. For example, here we pick up the friends in the familiar apartment on Baker Street where Watson is waiting for Holmes, who has disappeared. My dear doctor, I must apologize for running off, but I've had a great deal to do. Uh, I had this advertisement sent to every paper this morning. Yes. Read it in the lost and found column. Uh, in Brixton Road this morning... A plain gold wedding ring. Apply do Dr. Watson <clears throat> to 1B Baker Street between 8 and 9 this evening. I... Excuse me, excuse me, my using your name, but I, I fear that some of these dunderheads might recognize mine. Oh, uh, uh, it's quite all right. 
but what if someone applies? I have the ring. Oh, yes, you have. This will do very well. It's almost a facsimile. Ah. And, and who do you expect to answer this advertisement? Well, I've already told you. The man in the brown coat. Or he will send an accomplice. Huh. Well, I still don't understand why he wrote the word rash on the wall. Simply a blind to put the police on the wrong track. It was not written by a German because while the A was printed somewhat after the German fashion, huh. a real German invariably prints in Latin characters. So this was done by a clumsy imitator who overdid his part. Unless I'm very wrong, this will be our man now. Uh, come in. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, good evening, madam. Well, it's this advert has brought me. Now, as to this gold wedding ring in the Brixton Road, it belongs to my girl, Sally. As we married only this time 12 months which her husband is steward aboard a union boat. What he'd say if he comes home and her without a ring is more than I can think. Yes, yes. Well, um, is this her ring? Ah, the Lord be thanked. Sally will be a glad girl this night. Ah, that's the ring. Where are you going, Holmes? I'm at fun of her. She's obviously an accomplice. No, Watson, she'll lead me to the man I want. Well, after Holmes left, I had no other callers, and I sat puffing at my pipe while ten and then eleven o'clock passed with no word from him. It was close upon midnight when I heard his latchkey. Well, Holmes, how did it go? <laughs> Doctor, Doctor, you must promise me not to tell this to Lestrade because he'd never let me forget it. <laughs> what is it? What did she do? <laughs> I ran out after her and had no trouble keeping up as she'd gone only a little way before she began to limp and show every sign of exhaustion. Presently, she came to a halt and hailed a four-wheeler which was passing and she clambered in and I managed to perch myself behind. And I heard her sing out 13 Duncan Street Houndsditch. <laughs> Away we rattled. And just before the driver pulled up there, I hopped off and began lounging about down the street. I say. Well, actually, <laughs> I shall never forget that cab driver's face as he opened the door and waited expectantly, waited for the passenger who never came out. Well, you don't mean to say that that tottering, feeble old woman was able to get out of the cab while it was in motion without either you or... Old or... woman be damned. We were the old women to be taken in by that disguise. What? It was a young man, and he must have been an incomparable actor. And now we must look elsewhere to find our man... And our answer. My dear Holmes, congratulate me. I have solved the whole thing. You mean you're on the right track? The right track? Why, I have the man under lock and key. And the man's name is? Arthur Charpentier, sub-lieutenant of Her Majesty's Navy. Uh-huh. Well, I'm waiting to hear what sets you on the right track. Well, of course. The prime difficulty was in tracing the antecedents of this American. Now, Mr. Holmes, do you remember the hat we found beside the dead man? Mm hmm John Underwood and Sons, 129 Camberwell Road. Why, well, I'd no idea you'd noticed that. Have you been there? No. Oh. <laughs> well, anyway, I never neglect a chance, no matter how small. I went there and checked over his books and discovered that he'd sold the hat to a Mr. Dribble riding at Charpentier's boarding establishment, Torquay Terrace. Very, very smart. Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. And needless to say, I hurried right around to Torquay Terrace, and it was there I found the answer to the whole business. Well, not from Mrs. Charpentier, who runs the establishment, but from her daughter, a pretty young thing who speaks only the truth. Finally, her mother, seeing that the daughter was determined to answer my questions, resigned herself to it. And the girl told me the following story. Mr. Drebber has been with us nearly three weeks. He and his secretary, Mr. Stangerson. I like Mr. Stangerson, who was a quiet man. But I'm sorry to say that Mr. Drebber was a coarse, brutish sort of fellow who drank all the time and too much. Ah, uh, and? And that's why my mother asked him to leave. Because he was drinking too much, eh? And because when he did, he... He, well, he, he, he was rude to me. Rude. Well, you know, sir, not not respectful. 
So we were all glad when Mother told him he must leave, and he and Mr. Sangerson went off. On the day he was killed? Yes. And that was the last you saw of him? No. No, he came back. He claimed he missed his train. He was... Well, he had a lot to drink, and then right there in front of my mother. Well, now, it's all right, miss. This won't get into the papers, I promise. But he... He asked me to go away with him. Told me not to pay any attention to the old girl. Said he'd plenty of money and swore that I'd live like a princess. Well, mother told me to leave the room. And when I tried, he grabbed me. And that's when my brother came in. Ah, uh, and then? There was a struggle and shouting. And Arthur's very fond of me, you see. And I hid my face in my hands. Well, the next thing I know, Arthur came back laughing with a stick in his hand. He said to me, don't worry about that, fellow sis. He won't trouble you anymore. And I think I'll just keep an eye on him and see what he does with himself. Ah. Oh. And when did your brother come back? I don't know. You've no idea at all? I only know that I went to bed. Arthur had a latch key. And he must have let himself in with that. Very late. What's your theory, Lestrade? My theory is that he followed Drebber as far as Brixton Road. Now, he still had the cudgel with him, his sister told me about that. In Brixton Road, a fresh altercation arose and Charpentier hit him and killed him. Oh, perhaps unintentionally. And then, seeing what he'd done, he dragged the body into the untenanted house. The writing, the candle and the ring are all so many tricks to throw us off the scent. Uh -huh. Come in. Ah, I assume that note is for you, Inspector Lestrade. Oh, I'll give it here, please. Uh, good Lord. This is from Gregson. He says Stangerson's dead, been found murdered in his room at Halliday's Hotel. I cannot understand it. I certainly should have had word by now. Word about what, Holmes? Marriage, Watson, marriage. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe that the answer to both of those murders lies back in Cleveland, Ohio. An answer which I'm impatiently awaiting. Well, and, and if it's not forthcoming? Excellent question, Watson. We can spend this waiting time profitably, trying to track down our criminal. We cab to Soho, to a rather shabby building housing a number of theatrical agents. Watson... Well, I've just seen Jack Lysander, a theatrical agent friend of mine, and I've asked him if he knew of any young actors who specialized in character parts, particularly old ladies. Uh, from the look in your eyes, I, I deduce that he did. Eh? Uh, capital, Watson. You'll make a detective yet. Oh. He not only knew the fellow, name of Royce Barty, but he gave me his address, and it's just around the corner here. Hello, what's this? The Strad here. Well, it beats me, Mr. Holmes, how you do it. But you turn up almost as quickly as we do. Well, how did you get the news? Believe me, Lestrade, I don't know what you're talking about. I've just come along with Dr. Watson to see an actor by the name of Royce Barty. Well, that's exactly what I mean. I've just come from Mr. Barty's flat. We were called when the landlady went in and found out he's disappeared. And she also found a word scrawled on the wall. And the word was rush. Now, don't tell me you went her. Well, I would have honored Lestrade. But I do think that we ought to go into that pub over there and put our heads together over this latest development. Now, tell me, Mr. Holmes, what put you on to Barty, and how did you know about that word on the wall? First, first, please, have you had an answer to your telegram to America? Oh, yes. They know of uh, Mr. Drebber, but there's nothing against him. And so that proved to be a dead end. He's not a criminal. I never thought he was. Now, how about Barty, Mr. Holmes? Well, I connected him with the case because of the wedding ring we found when we moved Trevor's body. Oh, what in the world would he have to do with that? It's my belief that he was used as a cat's paw. A messenger employed by the murderer to recover the ring. Well, but even if that's true, why would he now disappear? Oh, hold on a minute. Perhaps we have another murder on our hands, eh? Is that possible, Mr. Holmes? No, no, we are quite done with murders on this case, Mr. Stroud. 
What makes you so certain? Because once again, the killer has tried to throw us off the trail. He's a clever man. And once he realized that I had deduced that Barty was used as a messenger, he must have paid him to clear out. The word rush is just another attempt to throw us off the trail. Now, you say all this without asking me anything about the Stangerson murder. I ask you only one thing about it. How was he killed? With the dagger. Hmm. Well, that's a bit of a blow. <laughs> and I hope this won't be another. What do you think was written on the wall? Written in blood. Above the bed of the murdered man. That's the word rush, of course. But I still need one more thing before my case is complete. As an avid reader of detective stories, I've always felt some resentment when the detective proudly announces that his case is complete and, of course, I haven't the slightest idea in the world what the solution is. However, I must say that of all the fictional detectives who use this device, Holmes irritates me the least. Perhaps because I know his explanation will be lucid and not make a fool of the reader. We'll be back with that solution in just a few minutes. The pen is mightier than the sword. A cliché quote by now, but of course it's a cliché because it's so true. For example, Genghis Khan, Attila, Alexander, Napoleon, and Hitler all tried to conquer the world. They all failed. Whereas there's no country in our world where Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are unknown. The words from the pen of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle have been translated in every language spoken today. Mr. Holmes, here I am sitting in your flat talking when I have the strong feeling I should be out hot on the trail of this body who disappeared. But if you feel body so important, Inspector, I'll answer any question you want to put to him. Well, if you don't mind, sir, I'd rather be talking to the man myself. No, I assure you, I assure you, Lestrade, I'll give you almost word for word what Barty would say if he were sitting in this chair. Well, now, I might just take you up on that. Hmm? All right, Barty, why did you do a bunk? He was a great lark, and my pal asked me to do him this favor. He paid me to take his little vacation. I see. And was it also his idea to write that word on the wall? Absolutely. That was part of the game, you see. He told me he was playing a fancy trick on some of his old pals. Sort of a practical joke, and I went along with it. Anything wrong with that, Inspector? Can you tell me your pal's name? Oh, of course. Jefferson Hope. <laughs> When Holmes uttered the name, Lestrade's jaw dropped and his eyes bulged. I must say that I'm sure I had the same reaction. I, I, I simply couldn't contain myself. I say, Holmes, if you knew that, well, then... I, I'm sorry. I've, I've neglected to inform you, my dear doctor, that I received the answer I've been waiting for from America. Ah, and that gave you the name? Most assuredly. But what kind of question did you ask? That America sent you the name of the killer. I asked if there were any unusual circumstances surrounding the marriage of Enoch Drebber. Remember the ring this time? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. but, uh... The murderer evidently felt it was so important he was willing to risk capture to come back and get it. He also sent Barty after it. Good, well, I'll see that, but I'll still... The telegram that I received from America told me that Drebber had applied for the protection of the law against an old rival in love named Jefferson Hope. And that shortly after he made the application, he, Drebber, had left for Europe, and Hope had also disappeared from Cleveland. Oh, I take my hat off to you, Mr. Holmes. But you must admit that was a very lucky hit. Well, now that I have the name of the criminal and also a description. A description? From whom? And how did you get it? Oh, well, uh, a milkman on an early delivery was leaving bottles in the back of Halliday's Hotel when he noticed that a ladder, which was usually on the ground, was raised against a second-story window, which was open. He actually saw a man descend the ladder, but the man came down so openly that he just believed that he was some workman. And the description? <laughs> the milkman didn't take careful note, but he thought that the man was tallish, red-faced, and uh, 
uh, wore a brown overcoat. Ah, right, Chove. Hey, exactly as you said he'd look, Holmes. Of course, of course. Tell me, Lestrade, didn't you find anything else strange in the room? Oh, nothing of any importance. A novel with which he'd read himself to sleep was lying upon the bed and his pipe on a chair beside him. Mm. Uh, there was a glass of water on the table and on the windowsill a, a small box containing a couple of pills. The last link. Could you lay your hand on those pills? Well, I have them, but uh, I must say I don't attach any great importance to them. May I have them? Uh, thank you. Now, Doctor, uh, are these ordinary pills? Uh, <coughs> uh, certainly not. Well, I've rarely seen anything like them. From their lightness and transparency, I should imagine they're water-soluble. Precisely so. Now, Doctor, would you mind going down and fetching that poor little devil of a terrier which has been sick so long and which the landlady asked you to put out of its pain yesterday? Well, I fetched the dog. Well, he was indeed in a bad way. And I brought him tenderly back to the flat. Put the animal comfortably on a cushion there, Doctor. Uh, uh, and now, I will cut one of these pills in two. One half we will save... And the other I'll place in this wine glass, which has a teaspoonful of water at the bottom. See how easily it dissolves. Uh, well, this may all be very interesting, Mr. Holmes, but I... I don't see what it has to do with the death of Joseph Stangerson. Patience, Lestrade, patience. I'll add a little milk to make it palatable. And I'm sure that we will find that the dog laps it up readily enough. And, uh, and now what? Get a minute. In a minute, we shall see. These pills act very quickly. Oh, well, they do? Uh, not from what I can see. Mm. That can't be a coincidence. The very pills which I suspect killed Zebra are found after the death of Sanderson, and yet they're inert. Ah, of course, of course. Now I have it. Doctor, give me the other pill. <laughs> When I handed him the pill, he quickly cut it in two, added milk after the pill dissolved, and presented it to the terrier. Oh, the dog's tongue seemed hardly to have been moistened in it before he gave a convulsive shiver and lay rigid and lifeless, out of its suffering. All right, Mr. Holmes, you've been proved right again. But I still don't see how this will bring me any closer to this Jefferson Hope. Thanks to you, I have a name and a description. So if I could get cracking on this now, it shouldn't be too long before you hear that I have the fellow in custody. Good luck, Inspector. But I wonder if you'd humor me by lending me your handcuffs. You never know but what I might run across this Jefferson Hope before you do. Well, I've learned not to argue with you, Mr. Holmes. Here they are. Thank you. And please don't forget to return them if you don't use them. <laughs> Lestrade bustled off. I wondered why on earth Holmes had borrowed a pair of handcuffs. <laughs> My curiosity could no longer be restrained when Holmes came into the living room carrying a pair of boxes and a small portmanteau. Well, uh, surely, Holmes, you, you, you're not thinking of taking a trip at this time? No, I've always found it well to be prepared for anything at a moment's notice. Ah. Uh. That might be the man I'm expecting now. Come in. I didn't know you were expecting anyone. Uh, your cab's at the door downstairs, gentlemen. Very good. Perhaps you'd be so kind as to give me a hand with these boxes. See that they're strapped up securely? Oh, yes, of course, sir. Mm -hmm. Here, yeah. let me give you a hand. Ah, ah damnation. What devil's trick is Help Watson. Watson, he has a drink of Hang on to his arm, Tom. Ah. Well, doctor... Allow me to introduce you to Mr. Jefferson Hope, the murderer of Enoch Drebber and Joseph Sanderson. If you gents are reckoning on taking me to the police station, you're welcome to use my cab. That's a very generous offer. On the other hand, I'd be happy to tell you gentlemen all about everything right here and now because... I'm never going to trial. Well, I must say you're an impudently cool... Oh, hell no. You got me wrong. I heard your friend here call you doctor. You a medical man? Yes, yes, I am. Well, then you put your hands right here on my chest. That's it. Well, you, you have an aortic aneurysm. That's what they call it. 
The doctor saw me last week, told me it's bound to burst before too many days pass. What's your opinion, Watson? Is there immediate danger? No, well, Joe, there most certainly is. You're Sherlock Holmes, aren't you? Yes. Well, you kept in my trail as caution. <laughs> well, now that you know I'm a dying man, <laughs> you can be sure I'm not lying when I tell you that those two men were guilty of the death of two human beings. A father and a daughter. You ever hear of the Dicers Club? Never. Hmm. No surprise. It's in America. It's a club of gamblers. Trevor and Stangerson were charter members. My darling Lucy's father joined later. It was a black day for all of us when he joined. His name? John Perrier. He was a storekeeper out west, and I was a trapper and a scout. Oh, he had a lovely daughter named Lucy. And we fell in love. Her father approved. But by this time, he was doomed because he joined the Dicers. It was all up for him. Well, how do you mean? Well, I used to enjoy playing a hand or two of poker now and then. But I tell you, Doctor, there's some people who become crazed with a gambling fever. Oh, yes. yes, and John Ferrier was one of them. He could no more stop gambling than breathing. And he lost everything. Store, his savings. And finally... His daughter, Lucy. Well, don't tell me that a father gambled his daughter. Oh, no, no. No, Doctor. John Ferrier was a fine man, despite that one override and fall. No, no, no. He never stooped to that. No. It was Lucy who suggested it. A bargain, you mean? A devil's bargain. You see, Ferrier was badly in debt to both Drebber and Stangerson, and they were threatening him with jail. You know, debtor's prison. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Lucy couldn't stand the idea of her father in prison, and she well knew both of them were gone on her. In fact, before I came along, they wouldn't leave her alone. Her father, father had to forbid them the house. Mm, but it was she who went to them and suggested... Promised to marry one of them if they forgive her father's debt. Uh, Mr. Holmes, those, those devils, they, they, they worked out a scheme. Drebber worked it out. He went through a false marriage ceremony, and, and they shared her, the two of them. And I swore... Well, never mind. I, I, kept, I kept my oath. And what happened to Ferrier and Lucy? John shot himself, Lucy. She died of shame and a broken heart. Only two months after they tricked her. And you have been tracking them ever since? Ever since I took that false marriage ring from her dead finger. For eight long years I've been on that trail, and they've been on the run. Took every penny I had. When we got to London, I was flat broke. I applied at a cab owner's office and got a job right away because of my experience with horses. Well, after years of dogging their footsteps night and day, my chance came when they missed the Liverpool train that night. For the first time in eight years, they separated and when they missed the train, Drebber insisted he had business of his own and would meet Stangerson back on the train platform at 11. Mm-hmm. Then how did Stangerson come to be found at Halliday's Hotel? Stangerson realized Drebber was drunk and said that if Drebber didn't show up at the station, they'd meet at the hotel. And Drebber took your cab from the station? Hardly likely, Watson. Mm-hmm. If Hope was close enough to have overheard their conversation on the platform... He'd hardly have been able to get back to his cab in time for Drebber to have hailed him. That's exactly right, Mr. Holmes. Uh, but I, I followed him, and darned if he didn't go right back to the boarding house he just left. He wasn't inside more than five minutes before he was out again. A young man had him by the neck and practically threw him down the steps and into the street. You ever come near this house again, I'll flash you. Well, Drebber picked himself up and staggered over to my cab, jumped in, and said... How's this hotel driver? Unless you see a pub on the way. Then stop and I'll get myself a whiskey. I tell you, sir, my heart jumped with joy when I had him inside my But you still have the problem of getting him to the house in Brixton Road. Oh, I never doubted I would. Driver! Hey, driver! See if you can find another pub. I need a... Driver, where are we? Uh, we're here, sir. Let me give you a hand. It's Webb. Cold. 
I need drink. Damn it, it's dark in here. We'll soon have a light. With this candle. There. Now, Enoch Trevor, who am I? Who? Maybe this wedding ring will help you guess. Oh, you look at it, man. <laughs> Give us some hope. Now, either you or I will not see tomorrow's sun. Oh, well, would you murder me then? Oh, no, for you will select your punishment. Here. Here are two pills. Now, I swear upon my poor dead darling Lucy that one of them is harmless. And one, deadly poison. No. Here's justice for you, Drebber. You're a dicer, huh? Go on, now, you choose first. Choose. Uh, and, and it holds? I'll uh, slice you to bits until you beg for mercy. Now, take one of these. Go on. Choose. No, no, wait, 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 wait. All right, uh, uh, I'll take this. No. No, this this one. Swallow it, swallow it. No, it's good. Yeah, that's the way it was, gentlemen. The truth. I'd been so excited, I I first noticed the blood streaming from my nose. I wrote "rash" on the wall just to throw you off. And Stangerson wouldn't gamble. Was that why he was stabbed? He wouldn't submit to God's judgment. He knew he'd lose. Ow. Excuse me, gentlemen. Dear God. His aneurysm? Yes, oh, yes, oh, It burst. Well, when the start arrives, he'll be deprived of his trial, but not his triumph, if you allow him to use your notes, Doctor. <laughs> Well, happily, since they give you all the credit. No, I somehow don't think that that's the way it'll be reported. But that's the way both of us will gain mutual satisfaction. The publication of this story, A Study in Scarlet, marks the birth of the greatest detective figure in fiction. It not only launched the career of Arthur Conan Doyle as a writer but also laid the foundation for the ascent of the mystery story into the realms of the respectable. I'll be back with what Doyle really thought of same detectives Dupin and the Cook after these messages. This spring, reward your walls for their fine support of the ceiling with a new coat of True Test paint from True Value Hardware Stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you, during their interior paint sale, True Value Hardware Stores offer True Test interior paints at special prices. For example, True Test Easy Care Latex Flat Enamel, the wash and wear childproof paint, comes in white and 44 decorator colors for just $8.97 a gallon. Or you can choose True Test Satin Hue Interior Flat Latex, the washable finish for walls and ceilings in white and 44 colors for just $7.97 a gallon. And get True Test Marvel Luster Latex Semi Gloss, the ideal paint for woodwork and colors to match satin hue flat for only $8.97 a gallon. See the complete selection of True Test interior paints on sale at special prices during the interior paint sale going on now through April the 2nd exclusively at participating True Value hardware stores. True Value, that's more than just a name, remembers their way of doing business. been written and said about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He seemed to be a likable and modest man. However, the opinions he expressed about Poe's famous detective Dupin and Gaboriau's Lecoq showed him to be not without vanity. Of Dupin, Holmes said, now in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow. He had some analytical genius, no doubt, but he was by no means the phenomenon Poe appeared to have had. He was even stronger about Lecoq, whom he termed a miserable bungler who made me positively ill. To Doyle, as to the world, there was only one Sherlock Holmes. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Mary Jane Higby, Cork Benson, Earl Hammond, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> Now, a preview of our next tale. You have fever, Tuan. You stay quiet. Fever will burn away. I will take palm wine to men. You do not leave house, Tuan. 
Why should we have anything to fear from our own men? Let me point out something I have said before. I am the agent in charge here, and you are my assistant. <laughs> The person in charge is McCola, and don't try to deny it. You will not call me ridiculous in front of a servant. I won't stand for that kind of insubordination. If it happens once more... Yes, what will you do? I'll discharge you. You mean throw me out of our castle on stills? This vermin-infested hutch of a platform? You're welcome to the whole place. I'll head downstream to the coast. Well, you may do what you please. But you won't survive a day in the jungle. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>